what inspired you to do these 10 steps of prayer during crisis? And then we'll just go from there. <clears throat> right. Well, you know, uh, obviously I'm concerned like everybody else is, right? And um, <clears throat> as believers, when we're concerned, we go to the Lord in prayer. So uh, I've been praying a lot about this. And um, as you know, Rosario, you know me pretty well. Uh, I'm, uh, one of my giftings, I'm kind of pr a protective person by nature. And so one of my giftings, I could function in a system as, as, as its alarm system, if you will, a watchman on the wall. Yep. So um, <clears throat> I'm concerned about uh, this COVID-19 virus and its impact on the world, obviously on our country, our community, and on the church. So as I went to the Lord in prayer, um, I felt God started putting things on my heart uh, that needed to be prayed for. Uh, <clears throat> I'm usually someone who will... Um, research a lot what I'm going to be praying about. So I have informed intercession. So uh, I've done extensive amount of, uh, you know, I, I guess it, it's at least as much as the average person's doing, but probably a little more on what's going on and looking at a lot of different news sources and uh, trying to be informed in my intercession. So when I, uh, I begin to pray, God put on my heart various things that need to be prayed for. So I started praying for those, and then I felt the Lord impress upon my heart that there's many people that, uh, that want to pray but may not know specifically how to pray in this uh, season. <clears throat> so out of that, I developed uh, some of these, uh, make it easy, kind of, you know, 10 prayer guidelines. So that, that's, that's pretty much it. It's what inspired me to do that. I felt God put it on my heart. Has anything ever happened like this for you before? Uh, yeah, I get this regularly. Um, I felt uh, strong impressions to pray specifically when we had um, to the tornado that, that hit Dayton back in May. And then also uh, the shootings, the recent shootings we had here uh, in August. So sometimes I'll get uh, wisdom to pray before. Uh, and then sometimes I get wisdom to pray during or after. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, this this is something that uh, it just happens to me. I guess it's on it's on my uh, it's on my antenna. I pick it up in the spirit. Well, I don't want to waste any more time. Let's just dive into the ten methods, and feel free to give any illustrations to any of the methods that God has given you. Um, like I told you before, I feel like this is your next book, a booklet um, that you can share because I, I feel like this transcends any kind of crisis situation that churches may face or that we may face as a nation or as a world. So let's just dive in. Sure, sure. <clears throat> well, um, I don't know if uh, you have it before you or somehow in this uh cast either before or after there'll be like a listing of it so people can visually see it mm -hmm. uh, they'll have like a tool hopefully some sort of a visual um, but the first thing I felt led to pray for was uh, what's really impending right away on people and, and that is there's a lot of fear mm -hmm. there's a lot of fear there's a lot of uh, panic um, <clears throat> this is unprecedented um, we've all seen crises at some level you know, individual crises, family level crisis, uh, maybe a church level crisis, maybe even a, a city crisis. We've been through uh, recently, like I said, in Dayton, the school shootings, the tornado. Uh, we've had mass shootings in our country. We've had a, <laughs> since 9-11, it seems like we've really had a lot of crises one after another. Some of these are, have impacted various levels. Um, we even had uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, swine flu, the uh, H1N1 crisis back in 2009 and 10. And uh, those, that was actually a pandemic as well. But in, in all of my time, uh, X amount of years, uh, I've never seen anything like this. And I don't think we've ever seen, uh, at least in terms of the global response, what's being required of us globally. And that's been um, 
in many levels or another, but what's amounted to a shutdown globally. That's unprecedented. I heard a newscaster say that today. That's unprecedented in human history. So um, when we have something like that occurring, and we're seeing the, the various uh, projections, statistically, the math. Which was weird for me. At the beginning of Lent, I thought, oh, I should be reading through one of the Gospels. Uh, it could be overwhelming. So, you know, people are, are nervous. They're fearful. They're worried, they're anxious. Uh, they're hearing um, you know, reports like from our governor and, and from our director of, uh, of, of health and they're hearing, uh, you know, hey, we may be on lockdown for a while. We're gonna be closing down you know, restaurants. People are gonna be losing their jobs. It's already happening. And here's what the spread <clears throat> technically can look like. So people are fearful. There's a lot of panic, there's a lot of anxiety. So the first thing that I felt led to pray for is for peace. So that, that's the first thing is peace. Um, 2 Timothy 1.7. God has not given us, we know this verse, God has not given us a spirit of fear, uh, but of love, power, temperance, self-control, or a sound, sound mind, good judgment. So uh, the first guideline that I have in my guidelines is to pray against uh, any kind, anything that would uh, come against our, our peace in Christ. Uh, so division division within the body of Christ, uh, division in the country politically, uh, in terms of uh, <laughs> we're in election season. So uh, persons politicizing this, which is very easy to do. <clears throat> um, persons that feel we're not going far enough in our measures, people that are thinking we're going too far in our measures. Um, and these divisions may occur right down in a household. They may even occur within ourselves as we're battling as to what the balance is. Well, and just to interject, um, there are people that are not pleased with our governor for stopping right. elections, and then there are other people <clears throat> that are saying, hey, right on, you did the right thing. Um, and so as I, as you do, I look at my social media and it's others are calling for the impeachment of Governor DeWine and then others are cheering him on. Right. And it, it just shows um, the divisiveness that we have in our, not just local government, but our state government as well. Um, it's pretty discouraging to see that. Um, how does this, and, you know, maybe throwing a monkey wrench in, but people say, what do you think of the Spanish flu of 1918? And how does that relate to this epidemic? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, this is what we're going into now are uncharted waters. So we're trying to look for something to evaluate our current circumstance by. So what we're looking at are, you know, historical precedences, other examples where we've seen something like this. And so that's where, you know, the, the example of the, the Spanish flu is being drawn from. Uh, I don't wanna to get too much into comparison and contrast. There's a lot of contrast, obviously. And they, 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 do, they did not have and do not have some of the um, measures, means, and strategies that we have today. And uh, the wherewithal to look and know ahead of time, you know, what's coming our way. So, you know, a lot of the, the science and the stats that we have weren't available then. I think a, a more realistic approach is to look at what's already going on. We've seen what happened in China. <clears throat> We've seen what happened in South Korea. We see what's currently happening, happening in Italy and in Europe. And, um, a lot of what I've seen is that we're, the experts say that we're not too far, we're like two weeks behind Italy. And if you lay the graphs down, you see how it <clears throat> progressed and how it spiked and emerged in China and South Korea and now in Italy. We're seeing something very similar happening here. And uh, in fact, if you lay the numbers down, actually there, we actually have a little more, a few more, we have more cases than, uh, than Italy. We're about two weeks behind them. Um, so we see what's happening 
and we're in a position now where we can't stop what's going to happen. That's too late. It's already inside. Um, but what we can do is we can slow down what's going to occur inevitably. And it may not even occur as much as if we do no measures at all. <clears throat> so the social distancing, <clears throat> the quarantine, these sort of things, plus the testing is going to slow down what's going to be an emer would have been an emergence anyways. And yeah. you'll probably see less cases and less deaths as a result of it, where they're projected maybe 2.2 million deaths. You may be able to, if, if everything gets implemented the way we intend, and you could see less than a couple hundred thousand mm. as opposed to 2.2 million. So uh, I, who wants to see any deaths? And when you get to that kind of figures, it's, it's, it's just beyond, beyond our imagination, thinking of that kind of, a, that sort of horrific wake of, uh, of, of deaths. But again, 2.2 million or less than a couple hundred thousand. So uh, I, I think we have a precedence in what's gone ahead of us and knowing we're, we're on that same trajectory, but we have an opportunity with some very radical measures to make a difference and um, instead of it all spiking up at one time and overloading our system, especially our healthcare system, we don't have the hospitals, we don't have the hospital beds. Um, as it stands now, you're looking at, if, if it were to peak and spike where it should without us doing anything, you're gonna have eight patients to one bed. We don't have the beds, we don't have the ventilators. Um, our healthcare system wouldn't be able to handle it just like Italy's would. Now many say, oh, what is socialized medicine? Of course, the, you know, the Italy's system isn't that great because it's socialized. It's still one of the best in the world. And um, they still, per person, per capita, they still have uh, three to one in terms of more hospitals, doctors, available resources. It's almost three to one to what we have. Um, so, um, we, we, we don't have the capacity with the healthcare system. And of course, this healthcare system is a piece of a whole lot of other smaller systems that are, you know, that are networked to our whole system. As we can see now, this impacts Wall Street, this impacts our jobs, <clears throat> this impacts production, livelihood, the overall economy, and uh, our overall uh, life. So, uh, it, it isn't just one sector, it, it, it impacts the whole network that makes up society. So we have a chance now to kind of spread out over time an emerging crisis that is too much for our society to handle, a little overload. Hanging out a lot in the Old Testament, so you, which so was need, weird for me at the beginning. So you need those uh, extreme measures. And, uh, you know, like they said, some people are complaining about that. Um, it'll remain to be seen if the measures we took were sufficient. And you probably may never know by the fact that, you know, things at some point are going to bounce back. And I think it's a good indicator then that we did do the right thing. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I understand where people are coming from and the, the nature of the conflict within a state. I said maybe within a household or within ourselves, a conflict of, I mean, who wants to sit in the house this long? And we're probably going through almost like a grief cycle. Like at first we're like shocked yeah. by what's happening and yeah. in denial and in yeah. denial. Is this, is this really happening? Is really happening? It was overnight. It was a couple of weeks ago. It was in China. It was far away. South Korea, far away. And Italy, far away. <clears throat> I have family in Italy. So do you. So it's a little closer at home, but it's far away. Uh, we just, I just remember a couple of weeks ago, as you do you, we're getting the first cases here. Not that many. And then before Lots you minutes. know it, yep. yeah. And at this rate, of course, it's doubling every six days about. So it wasn't that long ago. I remember, hey, man, we were at 2,000 cases and just the beginning of the week, we were 4,000. Well, we're over 5,000 now. Mm -hmm. we're, we're over 5,000. Yeah. So um, it seems like the measures are extreme. They should have been done earlier. But again, it's not to blame anyone. We've never been in a place like this before. Um, you know, he, the, the president shut down the borders. That was good. We wish we could add testing early on. Um, there's a lot of glitches why we weren't able to get that in place. That's not one person or um, it wasn't just the CDC's fault. There was a lot, we, we just were not prepared 
to process this as fast as it need to be processed. And um, <clears throat> one of the criticisms, of course, is that the World Health Organization had um, test kits available, and why didn't we take them? Um, there was a massive amount of them. They, they, you know, where they, they were supposedly, you know, uh, had glitches in themselves, a lot of false negatives, false positives. Uh, they weren't some of those FDA approved. Uh, we didn't want to, we wanted to give the American public the best. That's what we're hearing from this administration. So that's their explanation as to why they, they waited. Mm -hmm. So where everyone stands on all of that is a whole other story. But finally, we're getting in production of test kits, distribution, local centers, drive-through centers. Uh, they're still slow, but in the next few days, they'll, they'll, they'll speed up. This is March 17th. Uh, they will speed up and we'll start to get the, the amounts that we need. We need in the tens of thousands of being tested. We know who's tested. We, we, we know who has it, who doesn't. We're able to better strategize, quarantine, separate, distance, all these sort of things to prevent spread. When you don't know, you don't know what you're dealing with. So a lot of people are infected, they don't know it. But as you know, it has a, it's 14 days maximum. I mean, statistically, 14 days where one could be asymptomatic. The average is about five days. Um, so you're as good as you were two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. So March 2nd, we can guarantee that, you know, uh, we, were, we, we were coronavirus free as individuals, probably March 2nd and before. Gotcha. But after you don't know. It's just like looking at, like um, uh, Dr. Acton said, it's like a light traveling. The light that we see in the sky, the stars, was light that was sent light years ago. It just took a long time to get here. Mm -hmm. So the you and I from two weeks ago is the real us. And every day following it will beam into the future <laughs> if we have the disease or not because it's, it could be up to two weeks where you don't manifest.